All right, welcome everybody to Northern Now, the digital event series for alumni and friends presented by NMU Alumni Relations. My name is Kylie Bunting. I am the digital engagement architect here at Alumni Relations at NMU. And I'm really glad that you have joined us for this event. We're really excited to showcase uh, some of our chefs here on campus and give you some great recipes to head into the summer with. Um, so I wanna talk about a couple of logistics before we get started. So while we are un unable to see and hear you in this webinar format, we still want to hear from you. So please use the Q&A function to ask any questions of the chefs. And moderator Diane Stone and I will be taking a look at those and making sure that we ask your questions to the chefs during the segment. So ask questions at any time um, that pertain to the recipes that they are showing and they can, they can answer your questions live as well. If you also want to chat with other um, attendees on here, find out what other alumni are joining us from where, when they graduated, that type of thing, you can use the chat function to do that. Just a quick note on that too, that there's a drop down menu to send your chats to all panelists or all panelists and attendees. Uh, the default is all panelists, which means any message that you send will just go to us. Um, but if you change it to all panelists and attendees, it will go to all of us plus everybody watching. So make sure you change that so you can chat with your fellow alums. And uh, just a couple of upcoming things. So this is our last Northern Now until October. Um, we've had a great season. We will be returning with this, um, but we're taking a little break for the summer. So a couple dates to mark on your calendar um, that are a little bit in the future. Save the date for homecoming weekend, October 1st and 2nd. And then also we will return Northern Now on October 13th. We'll be doing an alumni entrepreneur panel with our friends at Invent at NMU. So more information will be available on that a little bit later um, in the summer, and we hope you can join us for that. And we'll have a we'll have a great round of um, Northern Now events for you lined up as well. So we hope to see you then. And until then, we'll hope you have a wonderful summer. So keep in touch with us on social media. Um, follow us and share your story with us. We always want to hear from you, and um, we are excited to share some of these recipes. So I'm going to get right to it. Um, by introducing our moderator, Diane Stone, who is also an alumna, 2010 NMU grad and current NMU events manager. So welcome, Diane. Thank you so much for joining us. Hold, you have to unmute, Diane. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's alumni and chefs and excited for them to show you some great recipes for the summer. First, I'd like to welcome Chef Alden Griffiths, a 2010 NMU graduate and the executive chef of dining services at NMU. Chef Alden joined our team at the beginning of 2020 after years of experience in the industry, ranging from ice cream to baking to high volume line cooking to teaching. She loves sharing her knowledge and experience to help folks feel more comfortable in the kitchen. Welcome, Chef. And joining Chef Alden is NMU's Oper Operations Manager of Dining Services, Scott Abusan, a 2011 graduate of NMU's Hospitality Program. Scott began his career in hospitality working on campus as a student supervisor while attending NMU. He was also the president of the Culinary Club and an active member of the American Culinary Federation. Since graduation, Scott has experience in various culinary settings, including hotels, the Nordstrom Cafe, food trucks, and more. He enjoys cooking and trying new food in his free time and is excited to share his recipes with fellow alumni. Welcome Chef and Chef Scott. Thank you. All right, so I'm so excited to be here again with you all. Thank you for joining us. So today we decided to show you a meal from start to finish, something that would really kind of impress a, a nice dinner party, outside dinner party, barbecue, um, just a good old family meal, everywhere from salad down to dessert and a drink. So what I'm gonna do today is start with a salad. And this is one of my favorite 
favorite summer salads. It's a watermelon blueberry salad with a honey lime dressing. And then I have some torn mint that goes on top of it. This salad is really great for entertaining because you can do all the preparation ahead of time and then just assemble right before you put it to, on the table to serve. And that way it's really stunning and beautiful, but you're not tied up in the kitchen working on this prep while you're trying to also entertain guests. So the first thing I have here is just about two pounds. It's probably more like three or four, but I like lots of watermelon um, of chopped up watermelon. It doesn't have to be this uniform. That's just the chef and me. And I'm gonna put this on my platter here or it can be in a bowl. All right, and feel free to ask questions about what I'm doing or how I select fruit or any of those sorts of things. And we'll be happy to answer it throughout what we're doing here. So I have my watermelon chopped up here. Then I'm just gonna put my blueberries on here. This makes a really beautiful pop of color. What an awesome 4th of July salad this would be with your natural colors. And then I'm gonna take this. This is honey and lime juice, that's all it is. And you don't need really much else because there's so much flavor in the fruit that this just ties it all together. And I like to drizzle this on just before service because the sugar in your honey will help draw out the moisture in your watermelon. And it's already watermelon. So if you draw even more moisture, it can get a little runny. So I like to do that right before service. And then I have some mint that we got Right behind the Northern Center, we have an herb garden that we use in catering and in our dining services. And so this is from our own herb garden. And I just like to take this mint and actually just tear it. And the reason I like to tear it is because it releases all those beautiful aromatics and flavor from the herbs. Oh, I can smell it. Oh, it smells so good. And you put that on top. And as people scoop this off of your platter or whatever, then what that's gonna do is it'll scoop in there and mix just naturally as people get their own. And then a little chef secret is finishing salt. It's very important. Salt is very important for both sweet and savory application because the right amount of salt will actually enhance the flavor of whatever you're making. I'm gonna move this out of the way so you can see this beautiful salad. And so I just take this and I sprinkle it on top and this is a really nice sea salt. It's called Malden sea salt. I always make a joke because my name is Alden. It's my salt, it's Malden sea salt. And I just sprinkle this on top and that's gonna help draw out a little bit of the flavor from the watermelon and the mint and help complete the flavor profile of your dish. And it's just that easy. And you have this beautiful salad, it's delicious and a great first course. Now, Scott is going to demonstrate our main course for you. Would you like to take over, Scott? Yeah, thank you, Chef. Great. Uh, so for our main course, we're gonna be doing a barbecued pork chop. We had a brine and rub that went along with it. And then we're going to top it with a jicama and apple slaw and finish it with a maple bourbon drizzle. Um, for the okay. maple bourbon caramel sauce, I used uh, maple syrup that was actually made by a 2001 alumni named Jay Bitely. Uh, he currently makes maple syrup and honey. Uh, out of Curtis, Michigan here in the UP. So I wanted to go with him to source that. Um, so we brined the pork chop, which is back here on the grill already going. And it was brined in water, brown sugar, um, 10 high bourbon, as well as maple syrup. Um, once it brined for two days, we pulled it out and we applied the rub, which had different dry seasonings, uh, brown sugar, salt, um, paprika, cayenne, and a few others. Um, we then made the maple bourbon glaze, or I'm sorry, the honey garlic glaze, and that was with ketchup, honey, garlic, and lemon juice. Hey, Scott, how is finishing salt different than just regular salt? So finishing salt, I'll, I'll answer that while Scott's okay. going there. And because he's about ready to pull his, it looks like his beautiful pork chops off the grill. Finishing salt is, is just usually a salt that's really clean. So when you get table salts, like especially iodized salt, they add iodine to that. Um, this is a sea salt, has a very clean flavor. And that way you don't affect the flavor of the actual food on your plate. And you just bring that flavor out. And that's the biggest difference between like a finishing salt and say 
um, a kosher salt that you buy for cooking or a table salt that has iodine in it, the iodized salt. Now, can you, the salad that you made, can you use any type of salt or, or would you prefer the salt that you? Um, oh, okay. So chefs are really, really like their salts. So I have like five or six different types of salts that I use for different application, but practically speaking, I can tell you, you can use your salt at home and it will still be delicious <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Thank All you. Right, so Next up for the pork chops, I'm going to start with the jicama slaw. For that, I went with a red gala and green Granny Smith apple. Um, the in instructions tell you to julienne them. So a chef secret would be to use a mandolin, which makes it nice and easy. And what you're thinking of is fine matchstick cuts. They're going to be thin and uniform. Now, if someone didn't have a mandolin, would it be better for them to chop this by hand or to use, say, a box grater? Uh, I think a box grater would work very well. Okay, great. And then the bourbon you're using, does it matter the proof of bourbon? Uh, you want something with a little smoke, I would say. Um, but the one I used was, I think, Kentucky 10 High. Um, and you just don't want to overuse it because all you're going to taste is the alcohol ultimately. Um, but as long as you get it mixed in correctly, uh, when you finish with the caramel as well, it still gives it that sweetness. So it's gonna make it very, very tasty in the end. So in my bowl currently, I have the jicama as well as the Granny Smith and Gala apples. I'm adding cranberries and then I made a slight recipe change and I went with pistachios instead of walnuts, which I had put on the recipe. I'm gonna add my little bit of fresh squeezed lemon juice and then toss my slaw all together. Why don't you tilt it so I can see that beautiful slaw. There we go. So this is gonna bring out a lot of different colors and it's gonna give you a, a very nice flavor profile to go with the pork. So kind of add to onto this if we don't have questions is notice that Scott and I use citrus juices like all over the place and that's because Something that really helps the flavor of dishes is your salt content. And then we say acid in the kitchen, but we're talking about vinegars. We're talking about wine. We're talking about lemon juice, orange juice, lime juice, because that acid in the food will bring out the flavor as well. So you'll see that in a lot of really good recipes. There will always be a salt component and an acid component. All right, so to continue with this, I'm gonna go ahead and start to plate up my pork chop. You had to hide things out of the sun to make sure it still was good. <laughs> this is the, the beauty and the curse of cooking outside. <laughs> Do we have any questions, Diane? I actually have a question. Sure. So is there a modification if someone can't handle all of that acidity? Is there a way that you could modify that without using vinegar or um, acidic juices? Sure. Maybe, a, well, the acid component is really important, but you could probably get away with adding a different fruit juice that wasn't so acid forward. Okay. Just um, would have to experiment with a little bit with the flavor balance. Okay. So Scott, why don't you tell us what you did here? So what I went ahead and did is I put the slaw down on the bottom of the plate first. Then you put the pork chop on at an angle that gives you a little bit of height to your plate. And then you can add the finishing touch of your slaw on top. So you have color right there to help it finish. Um, if you still have your cranberries and pistachios, you can also put them on top just so you add a little bit of color on the outside of the plate. And then finally, we're gonna take our maple bourbon caramel. and you wanna just go completely around the plate, you can be somewhat liberal. And then when you eat your pork chop, you're just gonna put your pork in each little bit of caramel and go with it from there. That looks amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your process when you made that caramel? What are some things that um, if someone were trying this at home should look out for? So it is somewhat of a technical process to make the caramel. Um, when you add the sugar and water, you have to put it to medium to high heat and bring it to a boil and you let it sit at a boil 
and it'll go from the dissolved sugar and water to a clear mixture and then it'll start becoming more and more amber and you have to make sure you pull it uh, before it gets too dark so you want it to look about the color of a penny and then you're going to pull it off the heat because if you go any further you're going to get a burnt flavor um, as soon as you have that off the heat you're going to whisk your cream into it and you have to be rather careful because of the heat content in the boiling sugar and water it can kind of force it to the uh, cream to explode and go everywhere <laughs> so you want to slowly pour it in Slow. and make yes. sure you're whisking it in correctly um, as soon as your cream is completely added you're going to start mounting it with your butter so you should have small cubes of butter already cut up you're going to whisk those in as well and then as soon as that's done that's when i added the bourbon and the maple syrup and the vanilla and so once you have everything together you're going to have something that looks like caramel but it's going to be very loose because of the heat and so you're just going to let it cool off and then you can hold it for up to two weeks in a refrigerator and you just want to pull it out and have it outside the fridge for maybe an hour or two before you use it so that you're able to have this consistency where you can drizzle it over the plate okay uh, uh, Scott, how how large is that pork chop that you're using uh these were i believe eight to ten ounces it is a bone in Okay. Uh, and if you are able to get it, if you can see like where the bone comes up right here, I like to use these tomahawk pork chops, especially because when you get into the higher part, it's like basically a giant piece of bacon that's on the bone. And so you're, you eat the pork chop, but then you get this really tasty, fatty piece of bacon that's on the bone. It Amazing. looks fabulous. <laughs> Everyone is, is typing. It looks fabulous. <laughs> Great job. Also, one thing I just want to point out here too is a lot of times, you know, we're trained that there should be a vegetable on the plate, a starch like rice or potatoes, and then a protein like meat. And one thing I really like to encourage people is, is think plant forward. Think, like this, this is a complete meal. It's a beautiful meal. And, and you're not going to miss that big potato or whatever on the plate because all the flavors will go together. So when you're looking at food, as long as it goes together, it doesn't have to be that. In the kitchen, we call that a one, two, three. Like if you starch, you have your veg, you have your protein, one, two, three, you know? So it's good to kind of think a little outside the box because you're, you, it gives you more opportunity for flavor development for your dishes, for sure. So. And how long should you keep that pork chop on the grill for? Uh, depending on your size, you want to go about seven to nine minutes per side. Um, you really would be better off if you had a food thermometer and you can check it. You want it to be at a 145 degrees before you can cut and serve. Um, and then, you know, you can also always pull it from the grill and finish it in the oven. That might make it a little simpler. Um, with the honey garlic glaze that you put on, that will tend to increase the chance to burn. So after you baste it on, it could be recommended to go to the oven as well. Okay. Yeah. And you could do this in your oven too on a high heat and you'll still get that nice glaze. You won't get the smoky from the grill but you'll still get that nice glaze on there and the caramelization from the sugar in the glaze if you don't have a grill. Yeah. All right. Um, now, when you use butter, should the butter be cold? Or uh, for the caramel, when you're mounting it, you do want it to be cold. So you're going to pull it from the fridge. Um, I believe when I made this one, I used it was either six tablespoons or six ounces. And so I pulled that amount. I cut it off of my pound of butter, and then I cut it into small cubes. And I just added it a couple cubes at a time so that I could keep whisking it in and watching the consistency of the caramel as it begins to grow and form a caramel sauce. Great, thank you. Great, so do we have any other questions about our main entree before we move on? Okay, all right, so we're gonna move on. Um, I've got some peaches here I'm gonna put on to grill. And then while those are grilling, I'm gonna talk about ginger beer and how easy it is to make and how delicious it is, it is and how you could just drink it straight or make a nice drink out of it, which is what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna throw these on real quick. Thank you. And these are some really nice peaches that I got at the food co-op today. They are got they're really soft, which is great for flavor. But you have to keep an eye on them um, so that they don't get too soft on your grill. So I'm gonna let those work just for a few minutes. One thing about the the peaches is I like to get a nice grill on top, but then I flip them over and sprinkle a little bit of brown sugar and cinnamon on top. And that will kind of melt into your peach while the bottom is grilling and you finish softening that peach by grilling it. 
Also, when you grill fruit, it enhances their, the sweetness of the fruit. So be it watermelon, be it pineapple, or even peaches, it will, in, in, it will enhance that sweet flavor and give it a smoky component that is absolutely out of this world and something that, that really embodies summer for me. So I'm gonna pull these over while those grill. Make a little room here. Okay, so uh, in my magic of TV moment, ta-da, ginger beer. All right, let's talk about ginger beer. Ginger beer is really easy to brew at home and most of the ingredients you probably already have in your pantry. In this is water, ginger, lemon juice, sugar, and good old dry active yeast. And the reason that matters is I like this recipe a lot because a lot of people don't have a brewer's yeast or a fresh yeast on hand, but almost everybody has dry active yeast in their cupboard or their, their freezer, which is where I keep it, or you can go to the grocery store and find it very easily. And that's why I really like this recipe. It's delicious. This is great because then you don't have to worry about all of the possible artificial flavors, preservatives, or high fructose corn syrup that you find in other ginger beers. And it just tastes like ginger. It's delicious. So I've got my ginger beer here. And all you do to brew this is you take, it's, this is really important, a non-reactive container. So glass or plastic, do not do this in metal because as the acidity changes, when this is fermenting, it will interact with the metal and change the flavor in a not good way. So don't use metal. And so you take your water, your ginger, your sugar, all the ingredients, and you dissolve them in and you put them in a non-reactive container. I use cheesecloth, but you can put a towel over the top. It's just to keep things out really. And you let that sit on your counter overnight, at least 24 hours, but up to 36 hours and let it ferment. And it's really fun to watch. It's almost like a lava lamp where you would watch it kind of go bloop, 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 bloop. And you can see the fermentation happening. And then once that ferments overnight up to 36 hours, you strain it. And yes, you can strain it through a metal strainer. That's fine because it's not sitting in the metal. So I don't have any, I don't strain it through cheesecloth. I just strain it through a fine mesh strainer and it works just fine. Into another container. Are you gonna flip those for me? Yeah, Thank I'll you. <laughs> so I do that into another container. And then you have to tie it, you have to cover it in an airtight container. And that's really important because as it continues to ferment, once you put it in your refrigerator, it will create that effervescence that you're looking for in drinks like a Moscow Mule, which we're gonna to make today. So that's our ginger beer. Do we have any questions about ginger beer, Diane? Uh, no questions on ginger beer, but I do have a question in regards to your um, fruit. Do you oil that fruit prior to putting it on the grill? No. Nah. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I just throw it right on because, um, did you flip them? How are they looking? Okay. Cool. I will say we're going to flip them and then we're going to put a little sugar on them to finish. Yep. Um, because if they stick a little, it's not a big of a deal, but usually this is something you do at the end of the meal. And I don't know about you, but my grill's pretty well seasoned by the end of the meal because I've grilled burgers or pork chops or steaks or turkey burgers or hot dogs or whatever on my grill. And at that point it's pretty well seasoned. So I usually don't run into an issue of it sticking. You can though, it won't hurt it. You don't want to sugar them before you flip them though, because they will burn, burn, burn. So don't do that. Okay, so I got my ice it's stuck together a little bit here. That's why I'm doing that. So I've got my fancy scoop here. Okay, at home, I'll be really honest. At home when I make these, I do it in a coffee mug because I don't have fancy copper mugs. So that's okay too. All right, so I've got ice in here. We're gonna move this off. Then you want about four ounces of ginger beer. I'm gonna open this up and it smells. I wish you could smell it. Oh, it smells so good. And this again can stay up to two weeks in your refrigerator. And I just have this two ounce little jigger here. So I'm gonna just, be really fancy and dip it in here. Okay. What's great about this too, is that like even my kids like this and there's almost no actual alcohol content. So it's really a good thing for the whole family to enjoy the ginger beer, not the Moscow mule. Okay. So then we have, <laughs> we have our, we were using vodka. If you prefer tequila, that's just called the Mexican mule. That's an ounce and a half. This is two ounces. So I'm just eyeballing it. 
There we go. Put that in there. And then I've got lime. Lime is really important because again, the lime will help bring out the flavor of the ginger. So I'm just gonna squeeze a couple lime wedges in there, not that one. That one's a fancy one with a slit in it so I can put it on the edge. All right, Diane, do we have any questions coming through? Oh, I can't hear you, Diane, You're, you are muted. Um, just a question about the grill. Yep. I see wood sitting on the side. Yeah. But are you using wood chips and what, if so, what type of wood is that that you're using? Scott, that's a question for you. Um, we're using mostly oak. Uh, we actually had this left over from when we did an enhancement on campus and we made a uh, huli huli chicken for the students oh, at the Northern Lights. So, um, so we cooked about 2000 chicken thighs uh, over one day and we used two of these different grills and we just cooked nonstop. And the whole purpose of cooking with wood is it gives it that extra flavor profile. So it has a smoke to it. Um, and so you just have to learn to control the heat and know how to use the wood and apply it correctly and you can really get a great flavor. Yep. We love wood fire, fire grills. Chefs always like, you know, these little things, anything way we can, you can change the profile of something with a flavor or round it out or enhance it in some way. Chefs just love that stuff. And it's so easy and approachable. All right. So I'm gonna put my ginger beer down. Looks like my peaches are just right. He's gonna sprinkle sugar and we're gonna bring them over. I mixed up, it's good. It's important about the Moscow mules, make sure you mix them. Otherwise, you know, the alcohol sits on top, your ginger beer sits on the bottom and that's a, that's a stout first sip. <laughs> All right, so Scott has babysat my peaches for me. Thank you, Scott. I'm gonna pull them off real quick. Whoa, they smell amazing. Woo. The cool, the great thing about this too, is don't be afraid if it doesn't look perfect. That's okay. Much is forgiven if things taste amazing, let me tell you. All right. Ha ah, ha. Grill's nice and hot, I promise. <laughs> All right, so I've got these on a platter. If you wanted to plate these individually, then what I would do, let me move this over so you can see. I got this cool little bowl here. These are kind of small. So I would do two for these because they're a little bit smaller. And then let's see if my ice cream survived. Yes. Then I would take my ice cream here and whatever your favorite is. We, we have Cedar Crest here on campus. We love Cedar Crest ice cream and dining because it's a small batch ice cream that's made out of Wisconsin. And we try to go local as much as possible. So, <laughs> yep. So Chef, can use you it. use bourbon sauce with the peaches? Well, we were about to say that is. So I've got this here. I have some extra blueberries. See so you what know, I would do? I put a few blueberries on there. And then because we've got it, it's all part of the meal. We're totally gonna top this with some of that amazing bourbon sauce that Scott made. And then there you have, oh, there we go. You have this gorgeous grilled peaches. So you get the hot peaches, the cold ice cream, you get the smokiness from the bourbon. It's phenomenal, it's delicious. And then you get these little sweet bites when the blueberries, yummy. Can you grill the peaches on a skillet? Oh yeah, absolutely. You totally can. Good question. <laughs> All right, whatever questions you guys have for us. I have a question about your drink. Sure, yeah. How important is it to have ice in your drink? Um, well, the temperature is important. The reason we have ice drinks is because this drink is designed to be consumed at this temperature. And the reason that matters, and if you guys, you all didn't see it, but I kept like my vodka in the cooler with all the ice to keep it as cold as possible. My ginger beer, because we, we don't want the ice to water our drinks down. So technically you don't have to have it, but as things warm up, the flavor changes. That's why if you 
eat ice cream base. Have, have you ever eaten just the ice cream base or melted ice cream? It's like so sweet. It's because when things are eaten cold, they don't have as much flavor. So the drink is designed to be consumed cold. So although the ice isn't make or break, it keeps the, the drink at the temperature that it is best, it's designed for, that it's supposed to taste the best at. Okay, and how long can you keep that ginger beer um, in your refrigerator? For up to two weeks. So it is a live fermentation. There is live yeast in there. And so after about two weeks, it starts to run its course. It eats all the sugar and it, it, so, you know, vinegar comes from fermentation. A lot of people don't realize that. So white wine vinegar, red wine vinegar comes for, from basically further fermentation of those wines. If you continue to ferment it, then it will essentially turn to vinegar. <laughs> so that's why up to two weeks and then it's, it's done because it's either going to turn to vinegar or, or the yeast will die. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I don't have a whole lot of questions, um, but I have a question in regards to your um, watermelon salad. If you were having a picnic, it was warm outside and you, you had ice underneath um, your container, how long would that stay good? Um, and, or how, you know, how many hours could you leave that out for your guests? So in the industry, we kind of have some rules about that. So any fresh cut, we call it temperature sensitive food, you know, any temperature sensitive food um, for something like watermelon, that's more delicate because it's mostly water. I would not keep it out there more for more than a couple hours. It won't be dangerous at that point. Like it won't have bacteria growing in there that will make you sick, especially if you have it on ice, but it will also not be very it won't be as good anymore because the watermelon will be really soft and kind of warm and it just won't taste as good as it did when you first put it out. For safety reasons, you always want to make sure that anything that's sitting in ambient temperature like this, the 70 degree or higher, make sure you're consuming that within four hours if you're setting it out. That's very, very, very important. Any cut melons, any cut fruit, any sort of dairy product, um, anything that basically isn't dried or baked all the way through like a, a pie or a bread, make sure you're consuming that within four hours of taking it either out of being very hot or very cold. Okay, great. Um, what kind of wine um, would go good with the pork chops? Ooh, Ooh I would go with a, uh, white wine, either a Chardonnay or a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, Something white just gonna mesh well with the pork, and then it's also gonna bring out the flavors from the apple and the jicama. Yum. Okay. I, have I a think question. a cider would go very well with this pork chop, too. You know, like it, it's, I love ciders and beer, <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you that a cider would be phenomenal with this pork chop. The dryness of a cider, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I have a guest that's asking um, about blueberries. So, as we know, sometimes blueberries go bad quickly. Is there mm -hmm. a way to preserve those blueberries um, to keep them to last a little longer? There is a fly bugging me. Um, so the, the way we do is temperature consistency is very important when you're preserving um, sensitive fruits like berries. And then the other really important thing is to keep it dry. So if you're gonna rinse them and put them back in the refrigerator, you need to rinse them and then dry them off. And we actually do that in the kitchen a lot of times, the commercial kitchen, is we will rinse berries that we're gonna use the next day or two and then actually dry them out. This fly is very insistent. Let me tell you, I smell really good. <laughs> so that's the, that's the way we prolong the life. You gotta make sure, and also go through your berries when they come in like when you get them home from the grocery store and if there are any that are starting to turn, take them out because you know, the at one bad apple spoils the barrel. It's the same way with berries is if you have a berry in there that's starting to turn, it will turn the rest faster. Oh, that's good to know. I did not know that. Great. Learn something new every day. <laughs> All right. All right, Diane, what else do you have for us today? 
um, we, we have another question. Um, wine is great, but how about beer with your meal? What beer would you? A beer. <laughs> People are think. thirsty. So the, the weather's nice. I know. <laughs> Try to think of a really good beer. Think of local beers. Right. So I'm, I'm an IPA fan myself, so I would just put IPA with anything, honestly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm a big, I'm a darker beer fan. I like porters and <laughs> so anyway. I feel like, um, you know, any brewery, that you can find that has like a bourbon barrel aged. There's a lot of beers that are made that way and that would match well with the caramel sauce as well as the brine that's on the pork chop. Um, and so I think actually Black Rocks has one of those right now. I wish I could remember the name of it, but they are uh, running one currently. Okay. I do have a question in regards to your flavors. Um, when putting together your meal, how do you know what flavors to add with one another um, to make a good sauce or a good seasoning? Boy, do you wanna, I'm sure we both have interesting viewpoints on this. Do you wanna start? I think you should start, you're the okay. boss. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so whenever you're designing a dish, whether it's a single plate dish that you're going to put on your menu or a whole entire meal, the first thing you think about is the way that flavors go together and the presence of all five dominant flavors. Your tongue can taste five things. I'm going to get real technical for a second. So your tongue can only taste five things. And those five things are sweet, sour, salty, umami, and bitter. And that's the only five things your tongue can physically taste. Okay. The rest of your flavor is all scent. That's why when we lose, like we get stuffed up or have a sinus infection, we, we can't taste anything. It's because all we can taste are those five flavors. Okay. And umami for those who are going to ask, because that's a, a strange sounding word is the savory. It's a savory flavor. Um, a Japanese guy discovered umami. And so he made up the word. So it is umami and it's a Japanese word. And so a savory component is think of like a roast, think of roasted tomatoes, think of fish sauce, think of soy sauce, those really rich savory flavors that's your umami flavor that you taste. So the first thing I do when I'm designing a plate or flavors is I try to make sure that every one of those five flavors is on my plate or, or in my dish, okay? So on here, we've got apple and jicama. We've got, so we've got sweet. Um, you have your finishing salt, a little bit of salty. He's got the bourbon, which has just a teeny bit of like bitter aftertaste, a little smoky bitter aftertaste. You've got the grill that brings bitter to that. Then you've got sweet, salty, and then the acid in there. You have your sour. So all five flavors are present. Then you think about nuances of flavor. And so you think about the different flavors. Now, more people, most people know more about the way things go together than they think they do because we, we've been trained through what tastes good. When we eat something together and it tastes good. But if you wanna get creative, start thinking about your basic flavors and then start thinking about how food is similar. And then you'll be able to pair flavors together that you wouldn't think of before. One of my favorite sandwiches and, and people are gonna either go yes or they're gonna balk at this is a peanut butter and dill pickle sandwich. I love it. And people think, ew, gross. I mean, Scott, see, Scott's making a face. <laughs> but here's the thing. You have sweet and you have salty together. So you've got the peanut butter, you have that nutty flavor, and then you have the saltiness of the pickle. And oh, it just makes this phenomenal bite of so much flavor. It's delicious. And like I said, people are going to hate it or love it, but it's a great sandwich. And the reason why is because the flavor, the flavors melt together in ways that you don't think of, but all the basics we eat all the time. We eat sweet and salty all the time because we as humans love sweet and salty together. So that's how you approach a dish. And then also there's a lot of material out there that will teach you all about this. There's a book called the flavor Bible. That's amazing. And so many chefs have it. I have it on my bookshelf and it will tell you what goes well together. It is quite literally a glossary of what flavors go well together. You look stuff up and it tells you what it does. And it's a great way to get inspiration and to think outside the box. Great, Scott. Chef. Do you um, have anything to add to that? <laughs> well, a lot, but yeah. Thanks, <laughs> um, so yeah, like when putting this dish together specifically and other ones as well, uh, I try to like layer the flavors and you kind of want to think of the mouthfeel for when someone's going to be eating. So with this, you have the jicama and apples, which are going to be a little bit of crunchy and they're going to have juiciness to them as well. 
and then you also have the cranberries and the pistachio so it's going to be a soft chewy cranberry and then you have the crunchy pistachio um, then you have the caramel sauce that you can put the bites of pork into before you put it in your mouth and then you have the creamy barbecue sauce that's put on the pork itself um, and then with the pork being brined for two days ahead of time it's going to be extremely juicy and flavorful um, so when you put everything together it's just going to have these just layers of flavors and all these different mouthfeels that you're going to have while you're eating it Thank, and thank you, Scott, because I forgot to talk about texture and mouthfeel and how important that is. I mean, there are lots of people who are like, that's gross. And it's not necessarily the flavor. It's because it just does not feel good. It's not a good mouthfeel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, I have another safety question, food safety sure. question. If you had a potato salad, how long would you um, leave that out at a picnic? That's the, the same rules apply same rules that's a time temperature so the really technical term is called it's called time temperature controlled for safety it's a really long name so we squish it down to tcs if you hear a chef say that's tcs food what that means is that if you do not regulate the temperature of that food it could make somebody sick and so potato salad is the same way in fact baked potatoes are cooked starches are sneaky sneaky you've got to make sure that you're keeping cooked starches either hot, as in above 135 degrees, or cold, as in under 41 degrees. Okay, thank you. Um, a question about the berries. People like the berries. Um, <laughs> how do you dry your berries? Um, I lay them out on paper towel, and I we have big sheet trays, you know, in the kitchen, and I put the paper towel out, and I put the berries on there, and I roll them around. I literally do this. <laughs> and they roll around and that way I don't bruise or squish my berries and they dry off. And then I, I like to leave them uncovered in the cooler for a few hours so that they finish drying off before I put them back up. Oftentimes I'll just take that entire tray and put it into a thing we call a runner that's covered, it has walls in a cooler. And then that way I never have to put them back in another container or cover them back up. They are covered by the walls of the runner. And then that way they stay fresh and dry and they're ready to use whenever I need them because they're clean. I have a guest that's asking, how did you come up with such an amazing uh, main dish? Oh, hey, that was all Scott. Uh, <laughs> I just kind of racked my brain from different things I've done before and thought everything would work well together. Um, when we discussed doing this originally, we had wanted to be outside and use a wood fire grill. so figured the pork chop would go well and so I started with that and then built off of it so um you know starting any kind of meat that you can brine is always going to make it more flavorful so doing that and then adding the honey garlic glaze is going to give it another dimension of flavor um and then just trying to think like we were talking about the uh mouthfeel and what else we could add to it so jicama apple we're going to add color to it we're going to add crunch and then the pistachios, one of my favorites, as well as cranberries and everything together seemed like it would work out well. Great. Well, I can tell you that everyone is commenting how fantastic and delicious everything looks and they want to know when is dinner. <laughs> <laughs> When's dinner, right? <laughs> when are you going to invite me over so that I can experience your amazing rendition of this meal? <laughs> I want to see, I want to see you all get out there. I would love to see pictures of people trying stuff out. That was one of my favorite things in December is when someone would email me or call me about something else and they go, oh, by the way, I tried this and that from your, from your holiday uh, edition. And I was like, that is the best. That's, that's my favorite part of doing this is if, if we can help someone try something new or do something a little different then mission accomplished. We want, I, I love it when people get brave and do new things and have success in the kitchen because food is such an integral part of who we are as human beings. And so, yes, conquer that kitchen. <laughs> well, thank you both. Um, I have comments um, saying fantastic presentation. Um, everybody enjoys um, your segments and that they are excited for the next one. Woohoo! Well, thank you very much. It's our absolute pleasure to do this. It's so much fun and we're just happy to be able to be outside and showing you all this really great food 
And I hope we've inspired some of you to get in the kitchen or outside on your grill and try some of these recipes. But before I wrap up, um, Scott, there were some questions about brining the pork. You mentioned doing that for two days prior. Somebody right. asked if you should always do that. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Is there a marinade that you put it in while you do that? Or um, can you just go through that a little bit more? Um, yeah, so I mean, there's tons of different brines out there. I had sent one, uh, a recipe out that should be compiled with everything here. Um, and so you're kind of just adding sweet and saltiness to the meat before you do it. And so typically you're gonna do pork and chicken. It's gonna be the things that get brined the most, um, but it's just, you use salt, sugar, different fruits. Um, with this one, we use bourbon because that was gonna be in the caramel sauce. We also use maple syrup. Um, and then it's tech, I mean, it basically is the marinade. Like it's, for me, I had the pork chops in the brine in a Ziploc bag inside of a container. And then they just soak in that for however many days you can do for two to four days beforehand. And then you wanna take it out, pat it dry a little bit, and then you can season it from there. And that's something you should always do before you cook it, or is it not necessary? I mean, I wouldn't say it's 100% necessary, but I would say if you go that extra step, you're going to get the extra flavor every time you do it. Yep. And it also helps with, you know, pork notoriously dries out when you cook it, especially if you cook it too far. And so there are two ways you can avoid that. One, don't overcook your pork. <laughs> so get a meat thermometer and actually temp your your meat and pull it at between 140 and 145 people have been trained to not eat meat pork with any pink but i can tell you that if it's cooked if it comes to 145 degrees it's perfectly safe to eat and it's delicious and it won't be dry and then the second part of that is when we brine our, our proteins not to get too sciencey but science kicks in and actually forces um, more moisture into your protein via osmosis and so what's really cool about that is that you get flavor and you get more moisture. And so that's why brining is so important is because it helps protect against dry flavorless pork or turkey or yeah, whatever. Turkey. Turkey's really good. I always brine my turkey. Yep, huge. So we got in a whole discussion over the holiday session about that one, <laughs> about brining our turkey. <laughs> okay, um, we have a guest wondering is there any prep work involved in your grill uh, before or after? Good question. Cleaning. Uh, so for the wood fire, there's definitely some prep work involved. Um, you have to get the fire going and we were stoking it pretty generously before we started because with the wood logs, um, there's gonna be a high amount of flames that are gonna be burning. And so if you're cooking directly over the flames, you're gonna be burning your proteins. So what you wanna do is get the wood going. Um, it's basically gonna be like a campfire for 30 to 35 minutes. And then as those logs begin to burn out and you get coals, that's what you wanna cook on. You're gonna have an extreme high heat. Um, and it's gonna cook quicker than it would on your typical gas grill or propane, but it's going to be a much different flavor profile. And scrape your grill. <laughs> that's a good one too. Don't forget, it doesn't have to be pristine clean, but you need to scrape it because eventually it'll just catch fire. I've seen it happen in restaurants. It's not pleasant when it happens. <laughs> and the other thing with this was once the flames weren't extremely high, I moved the grate back over so that the grates were heated up. So that way, when you go to put your proteins on, they don't stick. Yep. Uh, and that's something that can happen when you brine because of the sugar content. Okay. What is the difference between a brine and a marinade? Uh, brine is more liquid. So when you think of a marinade, there's a multitude of things that you can use for different sauces. Uh, brine is typically going to be almost clear and some sort of sugar or salt water that just has other fruits or uh, dry spices included in it. Also, a marinade is more about a quick infusion of flavor and brine is more about that sort of long term. It should be watery because if a brine isn't watery, then osmosis can't happen. That's why it's really important. Like a marinade is usually thicker and a brine is really, really thin. And that's because science can't happen if it's too thick. <laughs> it's just that simple. <laughs> Great. Um, good job, chefs. We're hearing from everyone. Great job. 
And I don't have any more questions for you. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kylie. Sounds good. Well, thank you both so much. And thanks, Diane. Thank you everybody for joining us um, as we send you off into the summer. So we hope you go and try some of these recipes. And as Chef mentioned, uh, post them on social media, tag us on social if you try some of these dishes. And, um, and I know that we'd be happy to see some of that. So um, thank you all again. We're excited to pick up this digital event series again in the fall. So don't forget to join us in October. Keep an eye out for stuff. Uh, in the meantime, and I will also be sending out um, a link to the recipes. I did put it in the chat earlier, but you'll also be getting it in your email tomorrow um, from me. So keep an eye out there. You'll have a link to the recipes and also a link to a brief little survey to let us know how you like these events. And if there's anything else in the future that you would like to see out of these digital events, another cooking segment, perhaps. I, I first see lots of people asking about that. Um, We'll also be choosing one uh, winner from tonight's attendees to, to win an alumni t-shirt. So keep your eye uh, open on your email too and I'll be sending you if you are a lucky winner. And if any follow-up um, questions come about as you start to uh, work on these recipes or anything that you think of later on, feel free to email, email us at alumni at nmu.edu. We can always get these questions over to the chefs for you um, and get you any answers that you might need. Follow us on social media, keep an eye on things going on and um, stay connected with us. And thank you so much for joining us and we will see you again soon.